good to see each of you here this morning. Um, I want to take just a moment to thank you. I know uh, many of you have already asked, and uh, many of you have been praying for me this past week as I've um, been doing some mission events at a kids' camp uh, this last week in Prescott. Um, it was a great week. It was exhausting, but it was all worth it because we saw 25 kids come to know Christ this week. And so um, also many rededications, but we were super excited for that, and I appreciate your prayers. They were definitely felt and much needed because when something like that is going on, the evil one definitely wants to try to throw roadblocks in the way, and we experienced that, but um, God and your prayers saw us through that and resulted in seeing um, new young lives enter eternity um, for this coming you know, week, getting to know Jesus Christ and having their eternity impacted through your prayers. So we, I appreciate that very much. Um, I do want to encourage you, we do want to welcome one another to worship, and some of you have already been doing that. But I want to encourage you to find someone you've not yet welcomed to worship this morning and greet them. So if you'll stand and greet one another.
project ready or not, if you've not been able to participate in that in the past, or if you just want a refresher on it, that is coming up August 1st. Um, it'll be three weeks, August 1st, 8th, and 15th, and we will have sign-up sheets for that out there soon, probably next week, and so that you can get signed up for that as well. That will be held in the chapel center this time. And then we also want to just remind you that we are collecting, and next week will be the collection day for the back to school drive for Casa de Amor. So there are uh, sheets out in the entryway with a list of items that are needed, including backpacks and a lot of different school supplies. So if you can grab one of those today, if there's anything you can pick up this week, bring it with you next week and we will make sure that gets to Casa de Amor um, so they can just bless those children in their community um, with much needed supplies. All right, with that, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer and worship. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your love, for your amazing faithfulness, God. And what I thank you, Lord, for what I've seen you do in the lives of so many this last week. God, we just ask that as we spend this time with you together in worship today, Lord, that you would prepare us for the things that you have in store for us in this coming week. The encounters, the challenges, and the praises that we will be able to share as a result of spending time with you together today. We ask this in your name we pray.
John. You will, if you've not picked up on this already, you will see that the entire day of this morning worship is what we do. Sorry. What we do when we make it to the other side of our tribe. When we get to that other side of the sea, we praise him. And Linda and others have worked diligently to make sure that today is filled with praise. You know, a part of praising God and part of worshiping God is giving back our tithes and our offerings. We live in an in unbelievably blessed nation. Now, are we going through some trouble and some toil and heartache right now? You better believe it. And we're going to pray and we're going to focus on that a little bit later. <clears throat> But we have an opportunity right now to give back just a portion of what God has so graciously blessed us with. Father, we pray you would take yet again that which you have given us, that which you have blessed us with. We, we give it back to you and we ask God that you would use it in ways that are unimaginable to us, that those that hunger are fed. Those that are cold would receive warmth. Those that are thirsty would receive drink. Father, we thank you for the opportunity you give us to worship you as we have just done and as we continue to do. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
please stand and join me in the doxology. keeps faith forever, who ex executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of those who are blind. Yes. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. Yes. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow but he thwarts the way of the wicked. Yes. The Lord will reign forever. Amen. Your God, Zion, to all generations. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's do just that. seeing a sea of little kids. <laughs> I always would come to the front and I'd say, what do we do when we pray? We fold our hands, we bow our heads, <coughs> we shut our eyes, and we open our hearts. Is that right? Yes. yes. And they would all nod. So this morning I address you as a teacher. There are so many things in this world that are going wrong right now, but the one thing the Lord really loves is our joy, our happiness, and our praises for Him. Yes. So this morning we're going to pray. Lord, 
Daily you shower us with your love, your compassion, <coughs> your mercy, and the generous gift of your Son. We welcome before you this day to show our sincere thanksgiving. We are fallible every day and move the depths of your forgiveness. We look forward to our eternal journey with you and we give heartfelt praise that you have chosen us for the recipients of your unending love. Yes. Your constant defense of us is not always known by us but we have your word that we will never be without your guiding hand of love. It is such a gift for all of your unending gifts of love and especially your son Jesus. We give praise, prayers, appreciation, and we are filled with joy. Great thank yous, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 <laughs> Speak. 
Gentlemen, thank you so much. What a blessing you are. This morning, I had the privilege of, well, I'm, I'm, you know, honesty is pretty important, right? I had the privilege of oversleeping this morning, is what I had, um, which was a blessing. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, but on the way to the office, running late, I received a text, Mitch, can you jump in on a call? And it was from a friend that I dearly trust and dearly love. And so I texted in the sequence and numbers and with a group of ministers from North Carolina, kind of going across the nation to Arizona and California, I was getting in on the very end of the call. And as I did my best to catch up on the conversation, it was one that a group of guys had got together. Some had already worshipped. They'd already had church. Church was over. Others, they were getting ready to begin, like our group and others on the West Coast. And it was a, it was a, a call to really be who we are as children of God, to ask the Father to intervene in a ridiculous world of chaos and confusion. We have built, how many weeks have we built to get to today, Linda? Eight, nine? Eight or nine weeks we built to get to today to talk about praising God. How are we going to get through the Red Sea? What's Exodus 14? What does this teach us? And as I'm listening to others talk, I, and I know some of you won't believe this, but I bet I didn't say two words in that phone call. Uh, I kept my mouth shut just listening to those that were much wiser than me. I'm, I was a little bit angry. And I thought, man, we have been working so long to get to a, a day that all we do is praise God. And then that still soft voice of God said, what does anything that happened yesterday have to do with today, Mitch? I am still God. I am still on the throne. And I am still worthy of praise. Amen? So I come before you as all of you do, very confused, wondering what in the world's going on. But I come before you as a pastor that knows this. My God still sits on the throne. My God is still in control. And today we are called to praise him. Amen. I so appreciate the way that we have worked diligently, <clears throat> excuse me, diligently 
to, to look at how we deal with trials and how we deal, most importantly, with traps. I've shared this with you already, and I'll share it again. I had the privilege a few weeks ago to uh, visit with one of our members that watches us online. And uh, they called and said, hey, Mitch, could you come by? I went by. And as we visited, they said, you've been talking about traps. And I just want to share with you a trap that I'm in and that God's leading me out of and appreciate the way the word of God is working in my life. We all deal with traps. And to summarize, those traps are this. We either put ourselves in them, right or wrong. We either have others try to put us in traps, right or wrong. But we have to identify there are times in our walk with God, in our journey through life, that God allows us, in fact, I'm take a really big step of faith here for some of you, that God puts us in traps of his own for the very purpose of learning to trust him. To be able to raise our hands and say, God, I, I can't go to my right. I can't go to my left. I can't go behind me because they want to kill me. And in front of me is an ocean that I cannot make it across. I am in a trap and I need your help. That is where God wants us the most. To say, God, I yield to you. And as we've seen in Exodus 14, God went through a series of events for the children of Israel and for Moses and for the Egyptians, by the way, to lead them through that trap. And ultimately it meant that, okay, there are times that we'll hit the, we'll, we'll hit the wall and we've got to ask, what do I do now, God? Where do I go from here? You know what's great about that is each and every one of us, at some degree or another, have all been at that point. Maybe personally, maybe within our family, our relationship, our business, where we literally do not know what the next step will be. And God causes that divine pause, if you will, in our life that we might ask, God, what do I do from here? Where do I go from here? What should my next step be? You remember a couple of weeks ago, we, we, we looked at in the Exodus chapter 14, where God was speaking to Moses. Now, I, I just need to chase a rabbit for a second. Can you imagine what it had to be like for Moses? He's dealing with, let's say, two million people. Trying to, I mean, talk about herding cats, right? I'm going to get these folks to go some direction that I don't even know where I'm going. And then on the other hand, he's hearing from Yahweh. He's hearing from God. And God says, Moses, why are you and the people standing here crying out to me? Well, God, we're kind of stuck. I can't go backwards. I can't lead them to the right. I can't lead them to the left. And there's this big body of water in front of me. And then God said, what? Do you remember? We've talked about this a lot. God said, God said, trust me. And God said, step forward. Just take the next step. In all of our lives, we've been at that point where we have just simply had to take the next step. Some of you saw me wearing my arm brace. I, I'll see tomorrow the third ortho surgeon that, and, and oh, Mitch of little faith. I, I guess I have to have three people tell me, yeah, you got to have surgery, okay? But tomorrow I will see him and I'm giving him all the paperwork and everything else. And Mona literally said yesterday, you know what he's going to say. Well, I don't know exactly. I think I know. And she said, Mitch, these nine things on your CAT scan say you have to have surgery. You've had two doctors tell you that, and you're going to have a third tell you tomorrow you need to have what? Surgery. And I said, well, okay, I just want to hear the third person say it. She said, well, I just said it. Can you pay me instead of him? <laughs> 
I just got done saying it, and just pay me. There are times, and, I, and I'm gutless, there are times that we what? Just need to step forward, and we need to go. And as we step, and if you'll remember, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that a, a, a commentator, uh, McHenry, gave me the most interesting perspective on this passage in Matthew, or Matthew, I'm sorry, in Exodus 14, that, and again, he wasn't stating this as gospel truth. He was saying, what if, all right? Great commentators do that, by the way. They're willing to say, what if God did this? McHenry said that, what if he didn't part the sea until they took that first step? And then they took the second step, and it was parted. Now imagine what all had to take place when the Red Sea was parted. It not, the waters not only had to divide, but the land had to dry. Not only did the waters have to divide and the land have to dry, but we had to figure out a way. And again, I want you to think about the mass of people. In the neighborhood of two million souls in the neighborhood are going to have to walk across dry land, parted waters, without getting stuck. And not just, and we're not just talking about two million men that were able to, you know, kind of high step it through the mud. We're talking about elderly. We're talking about children. We're talking about wagons. We're talking about goats. We're talking about everything the children of Israel had. An entire people group are forced and granted the privilege to walk across dry ground while they're being chased from behind. While everything to their left and everything to their right dictated to them, you're not going to make it. And yet God said, just take a step. Just take a step. Now, in my mind last week, I thought, how cool would it be if I just walked all the way to the back door and preach from the back today? I'm not going to do that because it creates problems, I know. And I would hear about it on Tuesday morning in staff meeting had I done that. So I dare not do that. But essentially, the children of Israel, led by Moses, walked across on dry land. They got to the other side, and they turned around, and the waters then imploded. And another thing that I believe with all my heart, not only did the waters implode and drop down, I believe dry ground went to mud immediately. I think God restored. I think God just said, okay, I got my children across. Now we're going to put everything back the way it was. And the Bible says in Exodus, the 14th chapter, that the children of Israel turned around and they literally saw the, the dead bodies of the Egyptians floating up onto the shore. God saved them. Last week, if you'll remember, we talked about the fact that God saved them in Egypt from the plagues and from the death angel. And then we see that God saved them as they crossed the Red Sea. Ultimately, we're going to see, and it's a different Hebrew, and as you translate into Greek word, that through the power of Jesus Christ coming and being the only begotten Son of God, being the Messiah, saved ultimately them completely. Amen? It's a process. They were saved from captivity. They were saved from the power of others having authority over them. But they had to recognize that ultimate salvation was coming in the form of a child. When they got to the other side in Exodus, the 15th chapter, we see something really interesting. I was sharing with, I don't know if it was Linda or someone else this week. I, uh, again, you, you go through Bible college and you get some seminary classes and then you get into the pastorate 35, 40 years later and you learn something. And in the book, of Exodus, the 15th chapter is the very first time 
when you look at the Bible and you read it through the way it was canonized from Genesis all the way through the book of the Revelation. In, in Exodus, the 15th chapter, it's the first time we ever see that anyone sang to God. Very first time. Now, I know Job, the book of Job was written probably the first and all the other stuff. But when we read the Bible, and as I studied uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, I learned that, that here in, in Exodus, the 15th chapter, Moses and the children of Israel began to sing praises to God. I guess I could end this morning's message. I'm not going to, by the way. But I guess I could end it by saying, when you get to that side of the trial, when you get to that side of the trap, when you get to that side of the ocean that you didn't think you'd ever be able to cross, just praise God. I, I could do that, but I'm not going to. You got dressed up and you want a 35-minute message, and I'm going to give that to you, okay? <laughs> Moses got to the other side. And in 18, in, in what we know to be 18 verses, really it was a little bit longer probably when you look at the translation, but they spent 18 verses, according to our language and the way we break it down, praising God for all he was. And they sang to God. And I... I can't help but believe we're worshiping right now. Some of you are, are um, you, you're, you enjoy it when the word of God is spoken. But the reality is the way we're made up, and I believe the way God created us, is that we praise God through that melodic way of singing and thanking God for who he is and what he's done. Wednesday night, I was unfair to those we had by the way we had 25 26 people come to dinner and bible study on wednesday night and we're doing a comparison of beliefs and if you just need to come we had a great time but i asked the question how many of you know the words to the pledge of allegiance well how many hands went up right everybody's hand went up how many of you know exactly the words to the apostles creed well, like most Bible and say, okay, a couple of you could lend it right now. Just what a brown noser. She's like, I do. <laughs> there are a handful of us that, that could, no, there are a handful of you that could. If I tried to do it right now, I'd probably mess up Linda. But when we get into those religious exercises, we're not as sure. And my fun test on Wednesday night was we... We have so much that we have the ability to memorize. We have so much that we have the ability to plant in our mind. And yet, there are other things that we don't spend that much discipline doing. How many hymns do we know we could just sing? Don't forget the theology in those hymns, by the way. Don't forget that. But also, we need to be so focused on the fact that I am going to praise God and I'm going to come to God and I am going to recount all the wonders and the majesty of the goodness of God. Linda's going to lead us in that in just a few minutes. That, that we need to proclaim, as we have already through song, God's goodness and God's grace. But I want to challenge us that when we get to the other side, let's make it more than a song. Let's make it a lifestyle. When we get to the other side of the trial, let's make it more than a song or something that is, is memorized within us. Let's make it a heartfelt attitude that we say praise God. Like many of you, since yesterday afternoon, I've watched the news. Uh, and I, I am a news addict, but I've watched it more than average. And it's interesting to me that in the last less than 24 hours, everyone talks about it was a divine moment. God's hand was in it. How long do you think we'll get before we stop talking about God's divine hand? It's not going to be too long, is it? It's not going to be too long. But it is the job of the child of God, 
that when we make it to the other side, when that, and, and I'm, I'm using this flippantly, I'm not trying to be funny, but when that bullet passes us just by inches, that we remain faithful to thank God for his divine intervention in our life. Each and every day, God intervenes. Each and every day, he provides for us. Mona and I were on our way to a, a it was a birthday party a gender revealing deal for my niece and nephew. They're having a baby. And we're driving down the 202 yesterday morning early. And there was a guy, bless his heart, I, you could tell he was had, had earphones in or something. He wasn't paying attention, but he changed lanes without looking. And he missed the car to his left, literally, by an inch or two. That's it. And I, Mona wasn't looking, and I commented, or I drew a breath or something. She said, what's wrong? And I, I told her about it. And, and the intervention was brief. The car continued down the road. But there was that moment in time that I can't help but think that God intervened and put one hand on one bumper and pushed one bumper a little faster. You know, those things happen, I believe, personally all the time. I believe that God intervenes and God works in our lives on a daily and moment-by-moment -moment basis. But yet all he wants is for us to acknowledge something as simple as this. God, I don't know exactly all that you saved me from today, but I know you saved me from some. God, I'm not exactly sure what you kept from happening today, but I know you kept something from happening. And I thank you for that. And I praise you for that. Exodus 15. They couldn't help but sing. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The house and the rider, the, I'm sorry, the, ho the house, the horse and the rider, he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, the Lord cast into the sea. And the choices of the officers are drowned in the Red Sea. I, I hope you hear how, I mean, it, this is PG-13 at best. When you think of the gravity of what they're looking at and what they're praising God for. It's okay. It's all right for us to acknowledge that God actively takes action for his children and those he loves. The deeps cover them, and they went down into the depths like a stone. The right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. The right hand, O Lord, shelters, shatters, excuse me, shatters the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellence, thou dost overthrow who rises against us. You send forth your burning anger and it consumes them as if they were nothing more than chaff. And in the blast, <laughs> I love this, in the blast of thy nostrils, O oh God, <clears throat> The waters 
were piled up. It, I, did you hear that? All it took for God to separate the sea was this. That's all it took. Here's how powerful God is. All he's got to do is just do this. And the water separated. And those that were watching God recognized it and praised him for it. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoils. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword. My hand shall destroy them. The Egyptians, that essentially is what they're saying. We're going to get our way. We may have made a mistake back in Egypt, but listen, we're coming and we have all the power in the world that we can literally divide and conquer them, kill them, and we'll take the spoils with us. Yet, verse 10, thou didst blow with thy wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like thee among the gods, O Yahweh? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working your wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. In thy loving kindness, in your loving kindness, God, you led your people whom thou hast redeemed. I've, I've got to stop there and, and go back and say that that word redeemed literally reaches back to when they were in Egypt. He saved them from the death angel. He redeemed them from the plagues. Now he has got them across the Red Sea and he has redeemed them from defeat, from being uh, overtaken. But yet there's another redemption that he desires. So many of us today have a, a dating relationship with God. And here's what I mean by that. We, we do church and we we sing the songs and we do everything else. Been reading, a, a, in fact, the entire staff and I've been reading a book on uh, discipleship by a guy named Comer. And the more I read it, I'm going, I've gone through it, by the way, for the fourth time, for the fourth time, Linda. The, the more I am reminded that discipleship is a noun. It's not a verb. It's not something you do. It's who you are. And if you're here today and you're in a dating relationship with God, you do God, but you don't have a relationship with God, then I want to encourage you that before you go home today, seek out one of us. Let us tell you what it means to have a relationship with God. Doing God is not necessarily knowing God. And the children of Israel, they're singing, and as they sang this song, they're talking about the fact that God's redeemed us, he saved us, but do they realize, and I propose to you they did not realize, that they were not known by God yet. They had not, they had not, and had not the privilege yet to recognize the Messiah. I did, I believe it was Wednesday morning, Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning, early in the morning, I did a Google search. And I, as I spoke into my computer, I said, what are the prominent praise verses in the Bible for God? Now, I, I said it differently. Wait. No, what are the prominent verses in the Bible for praising God? That's how I did it. And it was in 12 font, one and a half space. I, I want to make sure I explain this to you. 18 and a half pages came out of verses. 
18 and a half pages of the Bible, how it is filled with, with verses. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Of how we are to give praise to God. And I, and, and by the way, Google came up with that. I'd be willing to bet Google missed some. I'd be willing to bet that. This week, when we realize what God has done for us, when we realize how God has provided for us, will we take the time to proclaim the goodness of God? And will we take the time to praise God? Or will we be simply like news commentators that say this, well, there was divine intervention, but let 48 hours go by and then we're going to see who we can blame who we can accuse or will we stand steadfast saying God you worked in my life in ways that I'll never understand and I want to be found proclaiming the goodness the goodness of who you are God and the way you work in my life and the way you provide for my life God would I be a voice that is heard proclaiming your goodness I'm going to ask that you stand right now just stand to your feet Linda's going to lead us would this be our prayer would this be our proclamation of praise Linda would you lead us
many of you believe that God really has been good to you this week? Amen. I'm going to give two of you, just two, while you remain standing, a chance to praise God for something he did this week. Who will be the first? Oh, he took the week off. I always worry about him overworking. I praise God for the grace and the mercy that he showed yesterday. And I pray that we as Christians will not fail to see that grace. It doesn't matter what political party you That's are. That's right. God showed up yesterday. He did. And he spared a person's life. Praise Others God. died. We pray for them. But um, we saw his grace yesterday. Praise God, Linda. Tracy, you had your hand up. Go ahead. 25 little souls gave their heart to Jesus this week. Okay, I'm going to give one, because the staff has been sharing, I'm going to give one lay person. Surely you've been motivated. One person share what God did in your life this week. Or you'll miss lunch. Judith Mary. Oh. Praise God. That's great. Good. May the Lord God bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord God make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord God lift his countenance upon you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the Lord God grant you peace. Go in that peace, praising God. God bless you. You're dismissed.